Hi, everybody. All right, let's get started. If anybody wants to tell me who they are, who's, you know, I see Myrna. If you feel like just telling me who you are in the chat or otherwise. Hi, Odette. Hi, Odette. Thank you so much. It's just so nice. You don't have to keep your, your video on, but it's just so nice to know who everybody is, if it's comfortable for you. Um, so, full disclosure before I start, I, this happens to me whenever I'm teaching. Hi, Carol. Whenever I'm teaching, I'm most, I'm most in particular, but really anything in the Nivi'im, I have, I have trouble stopping. <laughs> I have trouble choosing which chapters, you know, and every time I, I'm most in particular, every time I revisit it, I just want to teach everything in Amos. I, it's hard for me to um, skip a few chapters to the next and, and, and um, because there are so many rich ideas, rich language, powerful, powerful, and very relevant messages in Amos and imagery. And I'm going to share um, a pet peeve, more than a peeve. It's a very, actually something that really, really bothers me deeply when um, it, it, it's happened to me quite a few times um, when we would discuss syllabi, the syllabus in Hillel, and every year we would make choices about what we were going to teach and what we were not going to teach and what sometimes was successful, what is less successful. And I'd hear, sorry, but it's often the, the male faculty saying, um, the rabbis more often than the women saying, but we can't teach too much of the Nevi'im because they all sound the same. They keep repeating themselves. Every chapter is the same. And that used to drive me crazy. And it's still, I still find that so disturbing because um, all over the Nevi'im um, and in Amos in particular, every chapter, there are so many, um, not, you know, chapters, pieces, passages, um, short narratives that are so powerful and so memorable, um, each onto themselves, and um, and it's all in how we, in how carefully we read them, how we read them, and additionally, and I've sh I've shown that to you. I've tried to I, I showed that to you a few weeks ago when we um, when we studied Parak Aleph that. Um, which is the Haftarah for Parshat Vayeshev, and we looked at how the rabbis, over many hundreds of years of history, connected to that phrase, um, Evyon Ba'avor Na'alayim, and interpreted it um, according to so many different realities, found it so, just that word, shoes, they found so powerful and so triggering and such a, um, an important way of viewing the world and of viewing and of expressing Jewish values. Um, and today I'm going to use, I'm going to use, I'm going to look at another piece, um, a, a phrase in our, in the chapter that we're going to learn today and show how it's, uh, how it's used in the Gemara. And we'll get to that in a minute. What I'm trying to say is, <laughs> through all this, is that it's not just that a book like Amos, it's not just that Amos, the nine chapters of Amos are wonderful to read on their own, on their own merit, which they are. But Amos has become um, a text that echoes through Jewish history, through the history of Jewish thought, through Jewish liturgy, in the, in the, through the Haftarot. We're going to look at another Haftarot today briefly. Um, and through, because the rabbis quote Amos throughout the Talmud over and over and over again. The rabbis um, certainly did not say to themselves, oh, Amos, he just repeats himself, oh, himself over and over and over again. Are, are there themes that repeat in Amos? Absolutely. And that makes perfect sense because remember, the book of Amos consists of speeches that Amos delivered at different times in his life. And yes, because he's living at a certain time in history, 
and because he has um, very strong feelings about um, uh, you know certain aspects of Jewish society at that time, he is going to return and you know to to to, to themes consistently, but the imagery that he uses and the nuance and the different aspects um, of, of how he, the, the different aspects of society that he talks about in each speech are each absolutely memorable and impactful, each, each um, onto its own. And this, I'm, I'm pretty much committing to this being this summer's final class on Amos, but I encourage all of you to just pick up Amos and read it on your own. It's just really um, spectacular. And so today we're going to look at Perak Zion and Perak Tet, hopefully. Um, and I'm going to share my screen, which for me is essential because we're looking at a text, but I miss you when I share my screen. So, but nevertheless, here is my screen. If any of you want to open it, use a Tanakh, and um, it's um, Amos Peret. We're going to start with Perek Zion. Um. <laughs> okay. I got this. Okay, we're going to start with Amos, and then we're going to even take a look at Baba Metzia 59a. Okay, so in this chapter, and always imagine the Navi standing up before an assembling crowd of people, and he does something a little bit similar. He has, you know, a rhetorical technique that he returns to. Um, where I'm going, to, I'm going to show you, and you can see I've divided into paragraphs, and even if you look at it very, very quickly, it's, um, it's sort of, a, it, the, each paragraph is, is, is um, created with a refrain that, you know, they echo each other, right? But as you will remember from the first chapter, Al Shlosha Pishay Damesek, Al Shlosha Pishay Edom, Amon, and then, he packs a whammy with Al Shosha Pishay Yisrael, Lo Ashivenu. It's a rhetorical technique that pulls the people in, definitely. And also, and this is extremely important, it also renders the words of his speech easy to repeat. Because remember, people were not transcribing speeches, people were not reading. It's a barely literate society, but it was a very effective oral society. So people, for a Navi or an orator to be able to communicate in language and rhythm and refrains the repeat that people can go home and repeat to their friends and family, that made his message um, more impactful. And for all of us who are so... <laughs> So in the world of this, the social media world that we have today, it's actually, perhaps ironically, a very similar dynamic. So here, we're, but here we're going to look at three visions. Then, interestingly, there's another similar vision that he's going to um, return to, to Prakim forward in Parak um, Tet, which we'll look at hopefully in a little bit. I'm going to, I think I'm going to read them all in Hebrew. You read them in English or Hebrew with me. And maybe I'll comment a little bit because I think the impact comes from the, the, the three stanzas or paragraphs or visions building up to each other. Ko hirani Adonai Elohim v'hine yotzer govai b'tzchilat alo talekesh, halakesh, v'hine lekesh achar gizei hamelech. Vayak im kila lechol et esef haaretz, va omar, Adonai Elohim, slachna mi yakum yakov ki katonhu, mi ham Adonai alzot, lo tihie amar Adonai. Ko hir ani Adonai Elohim, vihine kore la riv ba esh Adonai Elohim, batochal et a home rabba, vachla et a hele. Vaomar Adonai Elohim Chadalna Miyakum Yaakov Kikatonhu 
ניחם אדוני על זאת, גם היא לא תהיה, אמר אדוני אלוהים. כה הראני, והנה אדוני ניצב על חומת ענך, ובידו ענך. ויאמר אדוני אלי, מה אתה רואה, עמוס? ואומר, ענך. ויאמר אדוני, הנני שם ענך בקרב עמי ישראל, לא אוסיף עוד עבור לו. ונשמו במות ישחק, ומקדשי ישראל יחרבו, וקמתי על בית ירבם בחרב. בחרב. Okay. So there are three visions, right? And in each one, each is a vision of destruction. And because of God's involved, it's clear that God is involved in each. So destruction is automatically interpret, interpreted as punishment. What we want to be careful, look at carefully is kind of the development um, um, within the three images. But also very importantly, and you might have picked up on this, the role of the players, right? The, what, where is Amos positioned? Where is God positioned in each one? So, ko hirani Hashem elokim. This is what God has shown me. First of all, and this is, you know, classic amongst the Nevi'im, the Navi asserts and wants his audience to be clear that this is a vision that God is showing me. This is a nevuah. This is me communicating God's message to you. And in this case, the image is of govai locust. In the very beginning, um, in the beginning of the um, sprouting, the new sprouts of the lekesh, the late sown crops, they, they, they explain. Vihine lekesh achar gizei hamelech, right? And it's, I'm not sure what that means exactly, but evoking the king, possibly the king's crops, is going to be significant. So, first of all, just the image of govai, I always tell my students, we hear locusts, we hear, we think grasshoppers, not terribly um, frightening, but just as a reminder to anci in ancient Israel, but this is true for populations in Africa and even in Israel today, locust is an image um, in, in agricultural societies in, you know, across the world. It's a devastating image of destruction. And I used to add, tell my, my students, for me growing up, an equivalent imagery, you know, because I grew up during the Cold War, an equivalent imagery would be the mushroom cloud. I used to draw that on the board for my high school students and they had no idea what I was talking about. But people my who grew up, when I grew up, a mushroom cloud was nuclear devastation. It was, it was, you know, evoked some of our most profound anxieties. And I used to then I used to, um, can everybody um, can you please unmute? There we go. I can. I don't think I. Can you mute, please? Okay. Can you hear me? It's Stephanie. It's Stephanie. Oh, Stephanie. Okay, I think that works. Okay, I, so when I was, um, so I, then I would draw an, a, a picture on the board of two, you know, tall, thin rectangles, which they automatically um, identified as the World Trade Center, which is the most terrifying imagery, image of their, at that time, of their young lives. I'm trying to figure out what it would look like today, but let's not go there. Um, so locust is that kind of, was for his audience that kind of image. It's an image, an image of locust covering a field is an image of total de destruction, devastating devastation to crops, famine, children malnourished and 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 dying of starvation. So, so he the end he he evokes the 
even the king's crops are going to be touched by that, maybe primarily the king's crops even. But here's, so, so this is the, Amos is telling the people, this is the image that God wants me to convey to you. And after the devastation was complete, after the locust had totally consumed the, the vegetation of the land, I, Amos said, right, he's, he's relating an auto, a, a small autobiographical um, moment. I turned to God and I said to God, Salah Hashem, Salahna, forgive. Please forgive. Miyakum Yaakov, who will protect Yaakov? Yaakov being not just the whole Jewish people, but in particular, code for the northern tribes. Miyakum Yaakov, Kikatonhu. Now he's not remembering, he's saying because there's, Yaakov is small or vulnerable, right? A child. Miyakum, he says, Salachna. But remember, he doesn't say salachna because they deserve to be um, um, forgiven, but just because they are vulnerable. And the result of Amos's intervention is Micham Hashem Azot, God relents. So in the vision, he's telling them, I had a dream last night, I had a vision of that our, our land will be destroyed and I intervened with God, I defended you, I asked God to forgive you um, because we are vulnerable and it was a su successful intervention. God relented, God changed his mind. You know that Nicham is a very powerful phrase. Maybe we'll come to back to that in a minute. Also, lo God says, okay, don't worry. This is not going what you, what I showed you in the vision is not going to happen. So this is sort of a new positioning for, Yaak for Amos, for the Navi. It's a shift in how he presents himself to the Jewish people, because typically his role, as we talked about for the last two weeks, and as you know, when I spoke on Shabbat Betamuz Yishayahu, the Navi's role typically is to be the, the harsh, devastatingly, uh, brutally honest communicator of truth, whether the truth of their sins, their corruption, and the truth that punishment is happening. But here, very deftly, Amos, by telling this episode in this way, he very deftly shows another side of himself to the people. Yes, I critique harshly. Yes, I warn you of punishment, but I also love you. I am also your defender before God. And that there is a way to prevent this. As much as I have been telling you that destruction is inevitable, there is a way to prevent this and a second image. Perhaps, Kohirani Hashem, this time, exactly the same beginning, God has shown me, this is all coming from God. I had a vision, God showed me a vision, and in this vision, he is Korei Larith, summoning to contend, doesn't really capture this, Korei Larith means, calling to judgment or calling to court, um, suing even, right? You know, um, you know, issuing a complaint, an argument in court. And in this case, the argument that God is bringing upon the Jewish people comes in the form of devouring fire. Hine kore lariv ba'esh, God is issuing his judgment or summoning his judgment through fire. And the fire is so powerful that it consumes Tahom Rabbah, it even consumes the deep waters, and it consumed the chalak, the fields. Ba'omar Hashem Elokim. Here again, Amos intervenes desperately. Chadalna, miyakum Yaakov kikatonhu. So it's the same intervention, again, positioning himself as the defender of the Jewish people. But in this case, he's 
abandoned the hope for forgiveness and he just says, stop, stop the destruction. Mia kum Yaakov. How, how will Jacob survive or who will stand up for Yaakov? Ki katonhu. He's a child. He's small. He's vulnerable. We need to think about his survival. And again, this time it, it, it's effective again. Nicham Hashem azot gam hi God relents again, changes the course, changes his mind, so to speak. This too will not happen. This destruction, this destruction too will not happen, God says. And here is a shift. Kohir ani, this is what he showed me. Vihine Hashem nitzav al chomat anach ubiado anach. Now, in this case, in the first two cases, it was implicit that God was implicit in the language and clear, but implicit that God was the author of the destruction. But here, the image itself shows God, right? You know, making it like crystal clear and very explicit that it's God himself who is holding the tool of destruction, standing on the wall, we're going to talk about that, and holding the anach, the tool of destruction. So let's just describe this image. God is standing on a wall, and the wall is called chomat anach. But anach is a construction tool, and it can be used in different ways. It's correct, it's, it's translated as, well, we would, I think we call it today a plumb line, but even today, a, um, a plumb, plumb line, let's like imagine a rope with a weight at the bottom, it can be used to destroy, right? A plumb line like, you know, being thrown against, you know, a wall, destroying it. But that rope with a weight at the bottom is also a leveler. So Chomat Anach is a wall that had been created with an Anach, meaning um, a beautiful wall with um, stones that are perfectly straight. So it's an image, you know, a, a, in other words, not a, not a you know, um, not a ramshackle um, hut that was, you know, made out of stones, but a wall that was created by an architect, by um, a highline builder with perfectly straight, um, with, its, with its stones arranged perfectly straight by a leveler. So the Chomat Anach is an image of, of, um, of luxury, a wall that's, you know, a, a, a beautiful wall. Um, so God is standing on this beautiful wall, or certainly a beautiful wall, and in God's hand is the Anach, a wall that has been made straight with an Anach, but in God's hand, there is an Anach. So it's a very interesting um, image that has dual meaning. And it's a meaning that's perfectly accessible to his audience. We later audiences need it to be interpreted a little bit, but even for us, I think the reali reality of it is accessible. But for his audiences, it's perfectly accessible. And I, I just, you know, I want to just add one thing about this beautiful wall is in that if, if you've, we didn't read all of the chapters of, of Amos, but Amos throughout the book um, talks about beautiful homes, bate, actually, choref u bate kayets, people who have summer homes and winter homes, bate shame, houses made of beautiful ivory. He talks about the opulence of his society and, you know, he talks about the opulence of his society in order to talk about the underlying corruption of society and the problematic um, challenges when there's a when there's this terrible gap between rich and poor in in Israelite society. So this Chomat Anach echoes that for Amos. God is standing on top of your homes, which represent our society, which looks beautiful and straight, um, 
on the surface, but is really corrupt underneath. Now here all here, there's a shift. So the first shift is that in this vision, right? And remember his audience is expecting a repeat, right? Or something exactly, you know, with certainly with a similar, a similar um, imagery and, and similar rhythm as the first two. But it shifts first in where in God's, in, in including God as a major, as a primary player in the destruction, God, an image of God actually in his hand wreaking the destruction. But there's, a, there's another change. Vayomer Hashem Eli Ma'atero Amos. God has to, in the vision, and remember Amos is relating this vision to the people. So I saw this vision and God asked me, what do you see, Amos? Meaning that Amos had been rendered speechless by this image. In the other, in the first two images, it's easy for Amos to describe the image, but it almost seems that when Amos sees God himself on this wall with this tool of destruction, Amos, he can't speak. He doesn't say anything. So God has to prod him, provoke him. Vayomer Hashem, God says, what do you see, Amos? What do you make of this vision, Amos? And Amos says, I see an anach. I see the plumb line. He won't, Amos himself, won't go further in interpreting the, the vision. It's almost as if he's insisting that God spell it out himself. And by the way, for those of you who are familiar with, we actually, we, we studied one of the Yirmiyahu's Hakdasha. This language appears in Yirmiyahu also, where God asks Yirmiyahu, Ma'ataro e Yirmiyahu, and it's almost testing Yirmiyahu to see if he interprets the vision properly. But here, Amos doesn't even interpret it. He says, he, he, he answers in one word, okay, I see the plumb line, but I don't know, I, or I can't go on. I can't explain what this means. You have to do it, God. Vayomer Hashem, and God says, you want to know what the anach means? This is what it means. Hineni sam anach. I am going to place or use an anach, a plumb line, in the midst of my people, Yisrael, lo osif od avarlo. I will no longer pardon them, right? By, um, that language, I won't pass over this one. I can't, I can't forgive anymore. I can't allow this to go on. V'nashamu b'amot Yitzchak u'mikdashe Yisrael yecharavu v'kamti al beit yiravam b'charev. I am going to place, I'm going to use the plumb line to destroy in the midst of my people, Yisrael, and it will destroy, lay desolate, the bamot, the hills, or you, the high places, or you can call them the hills, the high places of Yitzchak, a play on Yitzchak, or Mikdashe Yisrael, and the temples of Yisrael will be destroyed, and I will rise up against the house, the dynasty of Yeravam Bacharav. Now it's interesting, when we introduced Treyasar, and I introduced Amos, you might remember, there are two King Yeravams in the history of the Northern Kingdom. And this can easily refer to both of them. Um, the first Yeravam, Ben Nevat, was the founder of the Kingdom of Israel, the king who broke away from Yehuda, who actually was the divider of the kingdoms, right? Who that he was the king that um, that broke away and created this historic division between Yehuda and Yisrael. So he's the founder of the kingdom that Amos is talking to. However, um, more in a more frightening way and in a more direct way, the king who is the king. Um, who is um, leading the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, at this very moment, is King Yeravam, Yeravam the second, Yeravam ben Yoash. Now, it's, they're not, the second Yeravam is not a descendant of the first. Um, so the more immediate, I, I think 
it's clear that Amos is referring to both of them. You know, I'm going to destroy this whole kingdom of Israel founded by Yeravam, but also it's a very direct and it turns into an accurate prediction of what's going to happen that, um, that God is about to Yeravam, the, the, the Yeravam is part of a very short-lived dynasty and his dynasty will be destroyed um, very soon. And that is, we're gonna, in a minute, we're gonna see that that is considered insightful, inflammatory, um, unpatriotic language on the part of Amos, and he's gonna get himself into some trouble for that. But before I go to that, I wanna show you, and I wanna just talk about that, um, that phrase, anach, for a few minutes. Um, so we saw for Amos's audience, and you might call this the pshat, the basic, most primary understanding of the word anach is clearly what we described. The understanding that Amos, the meaning that Amos is using it for, and the meaning that his audience will clearly um, understand. It's a plumb line used as a leveler in fancy building, but also as a, as a tool of destruction. I want to show you something very quickly. I don't know if any of you were, um, I, I, because I don't know exactly who's here. This is a, a, a Talmudic text that we studied before Corona, while we were having these classes in the yeshiva of Flatbush. Bava Metzia, 59a, Nuntet, Amud Aleph, is part of, um, it's part of the, um, we learned it in connection to this, the famous story of Lo Bashamayim He and Rabban Gamliel and um, Rabban Gamliel's wife. Um, <laughs> I can't remember her name. Okay, but either way, the topic though, the, the Talmudic halachic topic of that whole narrative is a, a halacha called Ona'a. And in this snippet of Gemara, Amar Rav Chizda, Kol HaSha'arim Nin'alim Chutz Mishare Ona'a. All of the gates of heaven are locked. In other words, you can't break down heaven. You can't, your prayers cannot reach heaven except for the gates of Ona'a. Ona'a meaning somebody who is um, oppressed, um, what is it? it yeah, this translation doesn't even, if you were anybody who is, who is, anybody who remembers our class in Flatbush, I had on the board, there was a constellation of, of, of words that can um, be, that can explain the mitzvah of ona'a. In this case, um, ona'a will be um, taking advantage of somebody, oppressing somebody, either financially or with words, right? But hurting somebody. Um, so, oh, and, and in the narrative of the, of the Gemara, there's a rabbi who seems to be a victim of Ona'a, of the other rabbis hurting him, and he cries, his cries go up to heaven and, and affect heaven. So, all the gates are, are locked except for Sha'arei Ona'a, Shen Amar. So, the rabbi who says all the gates of heaven are locked except for the gates of Ona'a, meaning the cries, the complaints, the, 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 this, the, the, the pain of somebody who is a victim of Ona'a penetrate heaven. How do we know this, the rabbis say? And they draw on the Pesukim that we are studying in Amos. As it says in Amos, the Lord stood behind a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hands. All right, in other words, the rabbis here take the word anach and interpret it, and this is a very, very midrashic interpretation, but you hear this similarity, anach ona'a, the two, you know, the first two letters, anach, the aleph nun, the aleph nun of ona'a. The rabbis use the, the, these, this passage in Amos, um, and they apply it to this halachic discussion of 
how how powerful and how significant Ona'a is, the halacha of Ona'a, which is, by the way, a oraita coming from, it starts in Parshat Kedoshim, right? So this is, this meaning of Ona'a, this kind of, we can call it a third, I'm sorry, this third meaning of Anach is definitely not a meaning that Amos had in mind, nor is it a meaning that his own audiences might have had in mind, I found it, I find it so fascinating and meaningful and magnificent that the rabbis had Amos in their minds, right? When they were talking about Ona'a and the word Anach and the image of God with a plumb line in his hand destroying the Jewish people, that passage from Amos and that image came to the to Rav Chizda's mind when talking about a person who is victimized, who is in pain by a verbal assault from another person. So again, the echoes of Amos, right? The degree to which Amos is internalized by rabbis, let's say, you know, it, you know, a thousand, more than a thousand years after Amos himself and the audience of the rabbis, by the way, are Talmud students, right? So I, I also find this so fascinating. If you can imagine that those passages in the Talmud are very, um, are very um, often studied in, 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 in Batei Midrash. So there are probably generations and generations and generations of young Talmud scholars who know that line in Amos through the Talmud and, and understand it in that way. But this is how Amos echoes through um, Jewish imagination and Jewish thinking throughout the ages. Okay, so now Amos delivers his speech and there is a swift pushback. And, you know, this is, um, this is the biographical, you know, this is the autobiographical. Um, this is what we have. We don't have a lot of Amos's autobiography. And, but these, this episode here is a very important part of his life story, which he shares with us and which he apparently shared with the people, perhaps in another speech or perhaps in the same speech. There's Amatia, who is the Kohen of Beit El. So he is a priest of the, 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 the city, the town of Beit El, which is in the southernmost portion of the northern kingdom. It's almost at the border of Yehuda. And Anybody who remembers Melachim Bet, who remembers how the um, kingdom was divided by the first year of Am, will remember that in the first year of Am set up golden calves in the south, um, in the very southern part of the northern kingdom, and in the north, in Beit El and Dan, in order to make sure that the people in this newly created northern kingdom would no longer travel to Jerusalem for, to bring sacrifices. So Amatia, the Kohen, he's not a Kohen, he's not a Kohen, um, let's call him, he's a priest, he's not a, he's not a real um, authentic um, Kohen. And Beit El is a temple of sorts, you might call it a shrine, but it is not a, um, um, an authentic, uh, legitimate shrine, right? It's a shrine designed from the, be from the very beginning to divert Jews from going to the Hamakom HaSher Yifchar, to go to Jerusalem, the site of the Beit HaMikdash. So Amatya Kohen, the Amatya is very deeply offended by Amos's speech. And first and foremost, I mean, partially because Amos is a, what do we call them? He's a, he's a disruptor, right? He's an instigator. He's definitely, you know, disrupting business as usual in Israel. 
but also very specifically, he said, as we heard, Nashamu Bamot Yisraku Mikdashe Yisrael Yeharahu. Amos predicted, he warned that as part of the punishment, he was very specific, the temples of Yisrael are going to be destroyed. And the temples are um, very much part of the power structure. So the Kohen gets very threatened and very angry, and he sends to Yeravam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos has, is conspiring against you. He is starting a rebellion um, amongst the people of Israel. The land can no longer contain his words. We got to do something about him. Kiko Amar, and he quotes Amos to, um, in his message to the king, Kiko Amar Amos, Bacherev Yamut Yeravam, you. He mentioned you, King um, Amos, mentioned you by name, that you will be killed, and that the people of Israel, Galo Yigled, this is almost a direct quote from another place in Amos, may alad mato. So he, he sends to the king, he complains to the king about Amos' um, 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 fomenting rebellion, and then he turns to Amos. Amos, Jose, seer as in S-E-E-R, seer, you, I think he's saying that because he's, it's another word for Navi, but he's relating to the visions that he has just seen and described. Seer, Jose, lech barach lecha, go. I would advise you, he, they translate it as off to you, but more um, accurately, he says, I would advise you to run away, to escape, to the land of Yehuda, go south to Yehuda, means make your living down in Yehuda. You want to be a prophet? You want to be an Abi? Go someplace else. You're in trouble here. Escape while you can to the land of Yehuda. Make your living as a prophet down there. And stop your prophesying in Beit El you know, in my town, right, in, in, the, in the kingdom of Israel. And it's so fascinating, the language that he uses, he mikdash melachi, ubeit mamlachahi. And that is very telling language, right? Because the temple at Beit El is the temple of, a, of the king. And it is, the, he, they, it's a king's sanctuary, or beit mamlachahu, but what he's saying is, in Israel, the temple, the religious temple, the, the site, you know, the, the Beit the, the, the temple in Israel is the power base of the king, right? And it's the equivalent, maybe. It's part of the house, the, the royal house, which is exactly the opposite of what the Beit HaMikdash had always represented in Yehuda, in Jerusalem, right? In, in, from the very, very beginning, the, the Beit HaMikdash was its own autonomous base of power. We had a, a total separation and most of the time, a pretty successful separation of powers. There was a monarchy in, in Yehuda, the Davidic monarchy, the Beit HaMikdash, and the Nevi'im were the, maybe the third pillar of power, and each could check each other, right? In other words, in Yerushalayim, the Beit HaMikdash is controlled by the Kohanim, by the legitimate Kohanim. The kings, even kings who brought, um, I mean, this, there's a lot of history to this, but the kings had no authority. The kings um, had no um control over the Beit HaMikdash, and that is part of the success of Yehuda, part of what contributed to the success of Yehuda for much of its history. This is actually the period when even Yehuda is starting to falter, and actually contemporary with Amos, you have an incident in Yehuda where King Uziyahu um, enters, who's mentioned in the very beginning of Amos as part of the historical context, King Uziyahu, who becomes very successful and very powerful, um, he, he actually intrudes into the Beit HaMikdash. He brings Ketoret into the Beit HaMikdash, right? Which was forbidden for a king. But in other words, he, 
he he tries to assert the power of the monarchy into the Beit HaMikdash and he is swiftly punished. Divine punishment comes to him because of that, because that is, it's absolutely impossible. So calling, saying that the, um, when Amatsya the Kohen says, make sure you get out of Beit El and make sure you stop talking about the temple in Beit El, because Beit El is Mikdash Melech, he's saying basically because it's protected by the king and because it's the power base of the king. But that's actually exactly what Amos is upset about, right? He's saying that worship, that <clears throat> religion, that the religion of the Jewish people should not be controlled by a corrupt monarchy, right? But going forward. And it's so interesting, by the way, whereas here Mikdash Melech is here a very negative, um, has a very negative moral connotation. But later in Jewish history, Mikdash Melech becomes um, a very accepted phrase. By Ya'an Amos, and this is very important, Amos responds to Amatia, Lo Navi Anochi, Lo Ben Anochi, Ben Navi Anochi. I am not a Navi. But he is a Navi. But he's, re he's reacting to Amatya saying, Echol sham lechem tinabe. Go make your living as a prophet down in Yehuda. Amos says, uh-uh, you got it wrong. I'm not a professional Navi. I don't make my living doing this. Actually, I'm a cattle man. I'm a cattle breeder. Ubole shikamim. I had fig orchards, right? I collected or I, 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 I tended fig, or, fig orchards. Perhaps, and this, this is kind of autobiographical and it's not so clear what was his profession, orig profession originally, but it's clear that he didn't start out his life being a Navi. He didn't choose, Amos is saying, I didn't choose this. I had a way to support myself and my family. I'm not doing this as a profession. I had no choice. This is why I am speaking to the people because This is the closest we get to a little mini Hakdasha for Amos. He's describing how he says, I'm only doing this because God took me away from my job, from my day job. He took me away from tending my flocks, and God sent me, God told me, go, go speak to my people Yisrael. Ata and now, Shema Devar Adonai, listen, Ata Omer, Lo Tinabeel Yisrael, Lo Tatif Abet Nishak, now listen to me, hear the word of God. You say, you're trying to tell me no more, no more prophesying. Don't prophesy. Don't bring, don't bring nevuot to the people of Israel. Don't pour forth a Beit Yitzchak. Well, lachen ko amar Adonai ishtecha ba'ir tizne u'banecha uvnotecha b'cherev yipolu ba'admatcha b'chevel yituchulak ve'ata al adama t'me'atamut. Because you are trying to force me to stop doing what God wants me to do, speaking the truth to the people of Israel, this is very painful. Attack on Amatya, Amos doesn't spare words. Your wife, right? The wife of the holy Kohen will prostitute herself in the will be forced to prostitute herself in the cities. Your children will be killed, will fall by the sword and your own land will be subdivided, you know, by ropes. Vata and you will die on impure, unclean soil, predicting the, um, the exile and the deportation of the 10 tribes. The Israel will be deported, exiled from its soil. Right, you who are, you know, who consider yourself to be the holy religious leader, you who think that 
being the temples will save you, right? Will uh, that 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 what you do in the temple is a proclamation of the innocence of your people, and that the temple will save you. You will be you specifically. You and your family will not be protected. Um, you will um, you will be destroyed. You will die after being deported. Okay, now I want to. I want to I want to just do a little bit of paractet um, um, for two reasons. One reason is that starting with Pasuk Zayin, it's another Haftarah, and interestingly, it's the Haftarah for Parshat Kedoshim, and also because it's the last chapter in Amos, and whoever edited Amos made sure to um, and not on a grim note, but and and on an optimistic, hopeful note. So the um, Amos, we can divide uh, Paraktet, let's say three sections. The first section is just interesting because it seems, even though it's two chapters later, it seems almost like it, um, it echoes the visions that we saw. Ra'iti et, remember, the, you know, another vision. I saw Hashem standing al hamizbeach, right? So here, God is not just standing on a on a on a straight, luxurious wall, but He's standing on the symbol of of religion. Mitzav al hamizbeach, not just the symbol of religion, but the symbol of the Jewish Jewish people's chosenness, perhaps, right? The, you know, they think that they are exempt as long as they keep coming to the altar, keep coming to the temples and bringing sacrifices, they feel that they're exempt from punishment. And what follows is, we can just very read it very quickly, Vayomer, hach bakaftor, strike the, 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 the lintels, the um, ashu um, hasifim, you know, and strike them and shake basically the structure of the, of the temple. So it will be fall, so it will, um, and it will fall on their heads. I'm going to try to read the Hebrew. You read the English with me. I'm just going to do this quickly because I want to go a little bit further. It's a, it's a devastating um, prophecy of destruction. Um, I'm in Pasuk Bet 2 here. Carmel. If they hide at the top of Mount Carmel, the symbol of, um, of lushness, of fertility, and in fact, literally, Carmel, the place where the Baal and Asherah were worshipped, Misham Achapes Achapes Ulekachtim, the Inisatru Mi Neged Enai Bakarka Hayam, Misham Atzave Et Hanachash Unishacham, Im Yelhuba Shivi Lifne Ovehem, Misham Atzave Tachere Baharagtam, the Samti Eni Alehem Lira'a. That's a, such a painful phrase. Instead of um, um, placing my eye, um, casting my view on them for good in a protective way, as we typically hear in Tanakh, this time I will cast my view on them for destruction, lira'a, the lolitoba, Bashem v'adonai Elohi. Elohim hatzvaot hanogea ba'aretz v'tamog v'tamog v'avlu kol yoshvei ba v'alta k'yeor kula v'shaka k'yeor mitzrayim habonem b'shamayim ma'alotav agudato al eretz yisada hakorei l'me hayam v'yishpachem al pne ha'aretz Adonai shemo. So this terrible image of destruction, and then this. Hello. Kivnei kushiyim atem li b'nei Yisrael. One minute. To me, the people of Israel, you are just like the Ethiopians, Hashem says. Halo et Yisrael he'eleti me'eret mitzrayim u'plishtim mi'kaftor v'ara mikir. You think you're the only 
people that I have redeemed. I, I think I mentioned this last week. In fact, you think you're the only nation, the only people that I have redeemed and taken out of one place and brought them to another place. There have been many migrations in the history of humanity, and I have done this for many people, right? So Amos, and just first of all, significantly, the rabbis choose this as the haftarah for Parshat Kedoshim. Kedoshim Tihiyuli, right? The Parshat Kedoshim asserts the Jewish people's Kedusha, the Jewish people's uniqueness, the Jewish people's Kedoshim um, um, chosenness, perhaps. And here, the rabbis totally invert and subvert that. The rabbis say, yes, you are Kedoshim. Yes, par the parasha that you just read in Torah asserts your unique Kedusha. However, this is the subversion of this. There's another side to this. You're not, you, Amos, um, Amos pushes back on that notion of chosenness, that the Jewish people is uniquely chosen and unconditionally chosen, right? And he's gonna, he mentions that someplace else, but I just wanna, uh, or let me just say this first, actually. It's not the first time that Amos um, relates to this issue of chosenness, that he challenges this issue of chosenness. And in fact, the whole first, um, the, the first class that we had, the first two chapters where he evokes, he, he, he um, critiques, right? He, he yells about all the other nations and then using the same language attacks the people of Israel. The structure of that messaging um, expresses the same notion. The same way, the same way I am concerned about the sins, the morality of all the nations surrounding you, Similarly, I am concerned about you. You are one of the nations of the earth. I'm concerned about all of them. And I am, and I am, I am, I, I, and I make demands. I have expectations of, of the morality of your societies. So Amos is, and he, this is, and then there's in Perak Gimel, following those, those two, that, 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 in, or that long speech, Another famous pasuk in, in, in Perak, the first two pasukim in Perak Gimel open, Rak etchem yadati mikol mishbachot ha'adama. Yes, I have chosen you. I have a special, Rak etchem yadati, right? I have a unique relationship with you from amongst all the people, of the other peoples. But here he said, he adds, Alkain pakadati Etchem. <laughs> because of this unique relationship I have with you, I, I, I demand a lot from you, and I, and I will hold you responsible for more. So Amos frames the notion, he's preoccupied with the, the question of what does it mean to be the chosen people? Um, what does it mean to be in a unique relationship with God? Um, he's pre Amos is preoccupied with it because his audience is preoccupied with it. And Amos, what Amos wants to do is challenge their, challenge their understanding of chosenness, challenge their understanding that being in this unique relationship with God makes them invincible, makes them um, untouchable allows them is gives them an exemption right to you know that gives you know get, makes them um the, and he ref, refers a lot to this idea which many of you might be familiar to with he talks about um karnot that as long which is a symbol of the you know there was this practice that if you held if a if a murderer held on to one of the corners of the mizbeach um he would not be able to be taken to justice. And that image comes up in Amos, but he applies it to the whole Jewish people. You think that you are exempt from punishment because you have this unique relationship with God. And here he really um, very intensely um, shambles that notion. You are just like all the other nations to me. And then he continues, and this is a, 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 
um, also a, a very pessimistic um, message. Your kingdom, right, is not exempt. Your kingdom is not invisible. It will be destroyed. And you will be scattered amongst the, the nations of the earth um, and so on. So I want to, I don't want to end without just looking at the final Pesukim of Amos because they're so transformative. And what always amazes me, and, and, and it's just, it's so extraordinary that a Navi like Amos, a religious personality like Amos, who can be so harsh in his criticism and so deeply hopeless about the Jewish people on one hand can also have this absolute, absolute optimism and hope and clarity that they can be and will be redeemed. Bayom hahu, Akim, and that day, Akim etzukat David hanofalat. I will, but there will be a day, God says, that I will rebuild the fallen Sukkah of David. And I will mend the breaches that have come in its, around it. I will rebuild, I will reestablish its ruins, and I will rebuild it like the days of old. Just keep that image of rebuilding its ruins in your mind. There will be days coming, Nuum Hashem. There will be days, right? Now he's turning to the agriculture where the land, in contrast to the locust and to the consuming fire, where your fields will be so fertile that the the Horesh, the 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 plowman, the person who's plowing, you won't the person who's plowing the fields will meet up with the people who are reaping the fields. In other words, there will be so much produce that they will all year round, constantly be planting and reaping and planting and reaping, and similar with the grape vines, right? It will the, the the land will be so fertile and productive. And the mountains will drip with juice or wine. I I, I say it's juice for a reason. Tit Mogagna, and all the hills will wave as with, you know, like fields of, of grain. Just a quick comment about, well, let me read the whole thing. Veshavti et shivut ami Yisrael, ubanim, and I will return, I will return the remnant of my people Israel. Ubanu arim nishamot, they will build cities that had been ruined. Veyashavu. They will plant vineyards and live to drink its, their wine. They will plant gardens and live to eat the fruits of those gardens. That's a very, um, that, that is a recurring um, image in Tanakh, and it actually begins in, um, in Sefer Devarim as a klala, as a curse. The, the harshest curse is you will plant vineyards and you will not be able to benefit from its produce. And similarly with your gardens and your homes. So this is a, re, this is a reversal of that, right? A reversal of the harshest warnings in Tanakh. And I will plant them on their land. They will no longer ever be uprooted from their lands. Amar Hashem Lohecha. And when I read these, I mean, I, don't know, I have tears in my eyes every time I read them. And I want to say that um, these lines were really embraced by early Zionists, right? The early Zionists, right? So we had in our class already, we've talked about the rabbis of the Gemara hearing echoes of, of Amos, 
but the early Zionists too, they embraced these, these lines in so many ways. You can imagine when I, I look at Jerusalem and I see Harisotiv, Harisotav Akim, a rebuilding of what had, of ruins, right? I, I, you know, we live in a generation that actually witnessed this, which is spectacular. Also, the agricultural, the, um, the, I don't know the history of this word. I, I always want to look it up. Maybe I'll ask Mrs. Harari, but anybody who's lived in Israel knows that Assis is the, the Jews company, right? Israeli, I don't know if it still happens when, you know, many years ago, Israeli children, you know, if they wanted juice, they'd say Assis, right? So it became a brand. <laughs> they, you know, the branding of juice in Israel was taken from Amos even. Um, um, and this is a song. This is one of the earliest, early Zionist songs I learned. We used to sing and dance to it. Vehitifu, vehitifu, heharimasis, vehol hagvaotit mokagna, vehol hagvaotit mokagna. You can look it up. But it's early Zionist. This is, you know, these are, these are, this is um, the part of Amos which early Zionists loved that they turned to and they used this language to talk about the miracle that they were in the midst of that they were participating in that they were witnessing in that they were witnessing um, um and you know i think that's the echo of amos that we hear in our days um and you know th th it's just so important um to to remember even at a time when you know, and what we've been focusing on is a lot about how the words of Amos force us to look, to examine critically some of the issues that we have in our own societies. But this notion, and even where, while Amos um, puts under the microscope in a very critical way, the notion of chosenness for the Jewish people, still Amos's vision for the Jewish people, that they will rebuild, that they that that one day there will be a redemption. The Jewish people will be brought back to their land. They will be able to rebuild what had been ruined and to plant and develop their land. That is very precious for Amos too, and you know that certainly is really important for us to echo when we read Amos today. Um, okay, I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Hi, everybody. Any questions? Any? I really, I encourage you all to just read the rest of Amos. You can ask me, you know, you can send me questions. Um, <laughs> Tova, the end, I'm just looking at the chats. The end of Amos is fitting for our country, our current situation, the pandemic, and for, we need an Amos for our time. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Maybe we have some. Are we listening to them? That's a great question. <laughs> or maybe really, you know, we don't have Nevi'im today who um, kind of sweep us off our feet, but maybe our own conversations should include some of that messaging, certainly. You know, I don't, I don't know. And I think the capacity of a Nevi, and this really it's a theme that goes through all of the Nevi'im, the biblical prophets, all of the Nevi'im. From Moshe, we see it very acutely and very clearly and beautifully in Moshe's life, right? Through all the Nevi'im. And there's, there's, maybe I'll bring you next time, there is some very, fa there's some very famous rabbinic conversation about uh, the capacity, the Nevi, like what makes a Nevi a Nevi, is the, his capacity to both be, in the rabbinic languages, the prosecutor of Israel and also the defense attorney for Israel before God, right? And I, that's one of the things that I wanted to show you today, that the Navi has to be able to at once criticize, but also love his people. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, I, you know, you know, I'll bring you that Gemara next week. It's very powerful. And they, the Gemara actually looks at different Nevi'im and actually evaluates them based on that criteria. Can they be both the prosecutor and the defense? 
can they both critique and love the Jewish people. And that, that's what God wants from the Navi, according to Gemara. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> thank you, Toba. Anyway, how are you all doing? Just a quick catching up. <laughs> Hi, Sprinza. All good. Kara, what state all are good. you in? I'm in New Jersey. I'm in Te Long Branch. You're in New Long. Jersey. Okay. <laughs> I, I yeah, know, but I have somebody from Israel here and uh, someone who made Aliyah and... Um, we're all over. <laughs> so next week, we're going to start Hosea, who is so very different. And I love that, too. I love what I, I, one of the great things about teaching Treyasar is you get, we're going to get to hear different personalities. Hosea has different concerns, and his um, strategies for communication are crazy. So we're going to talk about that, too. He gets very personal. Okay. Very okay. good. Thank Thanks you. So nice Thank to you. see everybody. Love you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Emily. Have a great week. Thank you. So nice mm -hmm. to see you all.